Hi, everybody. Welcome to reInvent. My name is Becky Weiss. I am a principal engineer. I work on our Virginia-based EC2 networking team. And the thing we're going to talk about today, virtual private cloud VPC, this is what I work on. So it is my honor and privilege today to introduce you to the concepts you need to know to create your virtual data center in the AWS cloud using VPC. Now, before we begin to kind of get an idea of who's here, how many of you here are, you consider yourself networking experts? Like maybe you have, maybe you have actually set up, a, 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 maybe you have set up a traditional data center, maybe you've set up your own corporate network. And those of you who are networking experts, you know that this takes uh, quite a bit of expertise, quite a bit of doing. You know, you need to know about things like addressing, subnetting, routing, firewalls, you need to know about services like DNS that you might run in your network. And even after you do that, it takes quite a bit of doing to maintain that and to see what's actually going on. Now, how many of you here are not from that kind of traditional networking background? You're from a more application development background where you, you, know, you want to build the thing that makes your business what it is and you want the network to just kind of work. Well, this talk is VPC and this talk is for both of you. Um, I'm going to show you some of the things you can do with your VPC that give you a lot of that control that you have in a traditional networking environment to make your network work exactly the way you want, bend it to your will, as it were. Um, but because it's virtual, it is easier, it is more flexible, and it is much more visible what is going on than ever before. How many of you here are already quite familiar with VPC, experts in VPC? All right, you got, you're in the wrong place. So this, <laughs> this, talk, this talk is going to be, it's going to be an overview of what you can do. It's, it's no accident that this talk is happening very early in reInvent. Um, there are a whole lot more deep, deep dives into various aspects of VPC that I'm just going to touch on today. Um, so you definitely want to look for those deep dives later if anything here piques your interest um, to learn more about. So let's begin. Um, and let's back way up. Let's start with the Elastic Compute Cloud EC2 instance. Now, an EC2 instance, it is a virtual machine running in the cloud. Now, this is a virtual, and, and, it's, and the E is for Elastic, which means you're probably running multiple of them. In fact, if you're doing the cloud right, you're probably taking advantage of this and scaling up when you need more and scaling down when you need less. Now, of course, these are virtual machines which means they're not sitting under your desk somewhere, which means the only way to do anything useful with these instances, the only way to get into or out of them, is with a network. And you know, these, these EC2 instances, they're running on hosts in our Amazon data centers, 11 regions around the world. And what the VPC is, in short, the VPC is your network that your EC2 instances run in the cloud, and that's really the long and short of it. So with, but the thing is, the P is for private. In a VPC, you get to call a lot of these shots. You get to decide exactly how this network looks and build it exactly the way that you want. For example, you get to choose, um, you get to choose what IP addresses you use. Um, here, I'll, I'll use some IP address. You get, to make, you get to make this choice. And in fact, since this is your own network, you're not sharing it with other customers. It is your own logical network. If you choose the same IP addresses as you, that's totally fine. These are isolated, again, your data center. Um, you, might decide that, you might decide you want your network split up into various subnetworks. You might do that so you can have part of it face the internet and have public IP addresses and part of it not. So what we're going to talk about today is, uh, we're, like I said, this is an overview into VPC. We are going to, I'm going to introduce you to the vocabulary that you need to get familiar enough with VPC concepts so that you can go home and start building your VPC and be productive with it. The, set, oh, the core set of things that you need to know to be productive with VPC for most, for most customers is actually not that much, and I'll walk you through that. And because these things are always better uh, with a concrete example, we're going to do that by way, uh, we're going to set up the simplest possible VPC out there. We're going to set up a simple internet connected VPC, which for many of you, if not most of you, that is 100% adequate to meet your needs in the cloud. But we'll walk through the details so that you can see exactly what your VPC is built up. And then finally, we're going to talk about more advanced connectivity scenarios. If you need something beyond a network that, is, uh, that has connectivity to the internet, we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about some services that make 
manageability in your VPC way, way easier than in a traditional networking environment. So let's get started. Well, you're gonna set up an internet-connected VPC. Now, I should mention that for those of you who have a new account with us since about late 2013, this VPC that I'm going to set up here, you already have one in your account. We have created one for you. It's called your default VPC. When you, if you just go and launch EC2 instances and you have one of these default VPCs, the instances just show up as part of your VPC. Of course, you can create other VPCs, you can do other things, but a lot of this stuff here is already done by default. But I want to walk you through it anyway so that you can understand, uh, so that you can really understand what it's made out of. And we're going to do this in four steps. First of all, a network is made out of uh, IP addresses, right? So we're going to have to do something about addressing. Networks are made out of subnetworks, so we're going to talk about that and why you would do that and what that means. And then we're going to talk about how you get between your network and the internet, and that's routing, and that's kind of, that's where the magic happens in a VPC. We're going to keep coming back and back to this topic. And then finally, your VPC is made out of security. You want to make sure that the traffic that you want gets to your EC2 instances in your VPC and not any of the traffic that you don't want. So first, let's get, like I said, you choose the IP addresses for your VPC, so let's choose them. And um, just a word on notation. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this notation, but in case you're not, you're going to see uh, CIDR notation here, classless interdomain routing. It's a convention for specifying uh, ranges of IP addresses. I'm giving you an example here. It looks like an IP address followed by a slash, followed by, the, by a number. And all that means is if I take that IP address and I write it out as a 32-bit binary number, uh, the slash 16 here, it means hold, this tie, hold the high 16 bits fixed, and the other bits can vary. In English, what this notation means, 172.31.0.0 slash 16, that means all of the addresses that are 172.31. something. something. So you're going to see this notation all over the place. Don't be thrown by it. This is what it means. Um, OK, so let's choose an IP. We have this VPC. Let's choose an IP address range for it. There, I chose one. OK, what went into that choice? What should you choose for your IP address range for your VPC? First of all, you'll notice, those of you who are familiar with, uh, with, with IP addressing schemes, you'll notice that I chose an RFC 1918 range. Now, RFC, is, uh, RFC 1918 is an RFC that defines address ranges that are customarily used for private networks. And the P is for private. That's what we're creating here. So unless you have a reason to do otherwise, I recommend that you choose an RFC 1918 range for your IP addresses. It'll be much easier for other people, people with a networking background who see your network to kind of intuit what's going on here. And then I chose slash 16 for the size of my VPC. Now, slash 16, that's actually the biggest VPC that we allow you to create today. That's 64,000 addresses. And you know what? I hope you use them all. But even if you don't, even if you only plan to launch a couple of EC2 instances here and there, your deployment's not going to be that big, I still recommend that you make a nice big VPC for it, unless you have a reason to do otherwise. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But creating a nice big VP, unlike almost everything else that we're going to talk about today, um, everything is so easy and configurable. That's the V in VPC. It's so easy to do. The IP address range that you choose for your VPC is fixed for the life of the VPC. So you want to make sure that it's big enough for you to grow into. So it costs you nothing to, make it, to allocate a huge address space for your VPC. You may as well do so. The only thing you need to think about with choosing this address range is that, um, is that you, we're going to talk about this later today. And uh, you may wish to, you may decide you want to connect your VPC with other networks that you have, like a corporate data center, or like maybe even another VPC. There are scenarios for all of this, and we enable all of this. Now, for the reasons that you think, your life will be a lot easier if you're trying to connect to another address that you don't, another address range that you don't overlap with. So avoid overlapping with other networks that you might be connecting with in the future. And we'll talk about those advanced connectivity scenarios later. OK, enough about addressing. Let's, uh, let's divide up our VPC into something called subnets. Now, as you know, we've got 11 regions around the world. AWS is in 11 regions around the world. You can launch VPCs in any of them. Your VPC 
in one of these regions, it is your network for your EC2 instances in that region. Now, those of you who kind of pay, pay attention to our availability story, you'll know that our regions are subdivided into each of them into multiple availability zones. Who here cares about building high availability applications? Oh boy, I sure do, right? Um, availability zones, availability zones are logically distinct parts of our VPC connected with a low latency link, but they are designed with availability in mind. They are designed to have separate failure characteristics from each other. And, you know, to go back to our example here, we have this VPC. For our running example here, we're going to, uh, we're, we're going to use the example of the Ireland region, EU West 1. Um, now, EU West 1 has three availability zones in it. Uh, they're called EU West 1A, 1B, and 1C. My VPC is my network in the Ireland region, and I want to deploy my application across all of these availability zones so that I can take advantage of the, I, so that my own application can be high availability built, you know, deployed across these multiple availability zones. So I actually want my VPC to span all of them. And this is where subnets come into the picture. A subnet is a part of your VPC that lives inside an availability zone. So I recommend when you're creating your VPC and you're getting started with your VPC that you create a subnet in each of the availability zones. So in each of your subnets that you create, you're going to allocate for it a sub-range of addresses from the range of addresses that you allocated for your VPC. So here you can see I've said this, this subnet, it's going to have addresses 172.31.0. something, 172.31.1. something here. And you'll notice that I choose a slash 24 for my subnet size. And this, unless you have a reason to do otherwise, I, I recommend that you start this way. A subnet in each availability zone with a slash 24 size. Slash 24 gets you 251 IP addresses in the subnet. Now, those of you who are paying attention are thinking, wait, two to the eighth, that's 256. That's not 251. Um, that is because we reserve the low four IP address and the broadcast IP addresses in the subnet for our own use. So a slash 24 subnet actually gets you 251 IP addresses. Now, depending on your point of view, 251 IP addresses in the availability zone is either a lot or moderate, um, and that's fine. You can always create more subnets later. You can have multiple subnets in an availability zone. Subnets live inside the availability zone, but you can have multiple subnets in the availability zone. And the reason why I didn't make these subnets huge is I didn't want to blow my entire large IP address range from my VPC in one go. So there's plenty of room in this address range around these subnets for me to create more subnets as I need them. And you'll see later why you might want additional subnets. Another thing, since we're creating an internet-connected VPC, which means my intention is to have every EC2 instance in the VPC have a public IP address. Uh, there's a setting on the VPC. This is a console screenshot. I mean, you're going to see a lot of these in my talk today because we're going to go into very concrete detail. Um, there's a setting here. If you check it, it will make it so that every time you launch an EC2 instance into your subnet, it automatically comes with a public IP address. Sometimes you want that. Sometimes you don't. We want it for this example, so I'm going to check that. Um, so you check this and you get an, a public IP address with every EC2 instance that you launch. So great, we got our subnets. To recap, here's what we've done so far. We've created a VPC in the Ireland region. We've given it a nice large address range, slash 16. We've created moderately sized subnets, one in each of the three availability zones in the Ireland region. So now I can launch EC2 instances anywhere in Ireland. And you know, I've given you some advice about sizes and I keep saying, unless you have a reason to do something else. We're going to talk about those reasons to do something else later. But let's set up our simple VPC right now and let's continue. And this is, this is where things get interesting in your VPC. Create a route to the internet. You, many of you hear the word route, think routers, think complicated. Think it, it's, it's actually, your VPC comes with a route table and it's a very, very simple concept. The route table for your VPC has a list of rules that tell it where the traffic is supposed to go and anybody can look at them and anybody can understand them and anybody, see, anybody can see what's happening in your VPC. So let's talk about these route tables. Um, the route tables contain rules for saying where your packets should go. Your VPC comes 
with a route default route table, which is the route table that governs how routing works in your whole VPC. You can override this on a subnet by subnet basis. That's a topic for later on. But let's go look at that. Let's go look at that default route table that came with my VPC. So all I did was set up my VPC and some subnets, and now I'm going to look at the route table. So if I look at this route table, I see that there is exactly one rule here. So let me, let me look at what this rule says. This rule says it has an address range of 172.31.0.0 slash 16, so that's the address range of my VPC. What that rule means that it, this rule is about packets that look like they're going to other EC2 instances within my VPC. And you'll see that it goes local. The routing for these packets that are destined for other EC2 instances in my VPC, they are routed locally within my VPC. Now, if I try to send a packet outside my VPC, it will have an address outside that range, and I don't have a routing rule for it, which means it goes nowhere. It gets dropped. So what I have here is a party in my VPC and nobody's invited. And this is not what I want, right? I wanted an internet connected VPC. So I need a rule that says what to do with those packets that are destined for the internet. So enter the internet gateway. So internet gateway, it is a thing that you can, it is a resource that you can create and attach to your VPC. And the, the, uh, the short version is IGW, Internet Gateway, and it's a thing to send packets to if you want them to go to the internet. So I've created this Internet Gateway, and now I create a rule. I create a rule saying 0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, that means everything gets routed to the IGW to the Internet Gateway. And the way, these route map, the, the way these route rules get applied is the uh, most specific route rule routing rule that applies to your packet is the one that dominates. So if you're sending a packet, um, if you're sending a packet from one EC2 instance to another within the VPC, it'll hit that 172.31 rule and get routed locally, which is what you want. If you're sending a packet anywhere else, it will get routed to the internet gateway and then the internet, which is what you want. Now I've had customers ask me, what is an internet gateway? Is this like a router you guys have? Is it a single point of failure? Is it a thing? Well, no, it's not a thing. It actually is a thing. It's a highly available lots of things that gets traffic between the internet and your VPC. Um, you do not need to worry about it as a single point of failure. It's an abstraction. It's an abstraction that makes this thing very easy to reason about. Zero slash zero goes to the internet. That's what you need to know. The rest just works. So here, everything that doesn't go to the VPC, I send it to the internet. So great. I have a route to the internet now, but I don't necessarily want everything from the internet coming to and from everything in my VPC, right? I want to control that. Um, I want to make sure that I get exactly the traffic that I want, only the traffic that I want. VPC gives you two tools to control this. One is network ACL, network access control lists, and the other is security groups. First, let's talk about network ACLs. It's a more straightforward concept, even if it's something that fewer customers use. For those of you who come from a traditional networking environment, uh, the analogous concept here is a stateless firewall rules. Um, so you'll see that uh, I have one for my, that governs my entire VPC. I can override it on a subnet by subnet basis. Um, if I go look at the rules, you'll see these look, these look a lot like firewall rules. They've got some address ranges. They're applied in a certain order according to that rule number. If you look at my rules here, you've seen I'm not really doing anything interesting with my network ACL. And many of you, many of you won't, but you can. Uh, if you have stateless firewall rules you'd like to bring over to your VPC, this is how you would, stateless firewall rules you'd like to bring over from your network, this is how you do it. The way you read this is, uh, the way you read this is that uh, um, rule 100 gets applied first. It matches everything because it's a zero slash zero rule, and I'm allowing it. So this rule isn't doing anything that interesting, but I could add more if I wanted to. Stateless means that uh, they're applied kind of, this is a blunt instrument. They're applied blindly without regard for whether this packet is part of, um, part of an established connection or not. This is just a blunt hammer. These rules get applied in the order specified to the packet that they see. Now let's talk about what you're almost certainly going to be using to get security in your VPC, and that's security groups. Now security groups are a very flexible abstraction for doing the equivalent of stateful firewall rules in your VPC. 
And they, can be made, they, they should be architected after the architecture of your application. Let me explain what I mean by that. So let's, let's use a very hypothetical, very naive example of an application that I'm running in my VPC. And I'll say that my application, and those of you who have ever run a non-trivial application, you know that all these instances here, they're not all doing the same thing. There's several different tiers, several different roles, several things going on here. So for this simple example, let's say I've got a bunch of web servers over here. Um, web servers, I'm building a public web service. I really do want traffic from the internet onto these instances. And then, when these web servers, when they accept requests from all my customers on the internet, I want them to turn around and make um, requests to my backend to get whatever information my customer needs in order to serve their request. And these backends, there's really no reason for anybody on the internet to be reaching into the backends. They're backends, they're not web servers, for, they're not outward facing web servers. So this is kind of the setup that I have. Now in reality, there's sort of more to it than this, like if I were actually building an application the cloudy way, I'd probably put a, an elastic load balancer in front of this, but I don't have all of this uh, because I want this to be simple. Um, so security groups. So what I do is I group each type of EC2 instance into a security group. I have a security group named my web servers and a security group called my backends. So security groups are groups. They're groups of EC2 instances that have various rules applied to them. Now, if I think about, from my application architecture point of view, think about in English what kind of security rules you want applied to each of these groups. Well, to my web servers, I want to allow web traffic from anywhere. That's what I want. I don't want traffic on arbitrary ports. I want the web traffic to these instances, but I want it from anywhere. And then into the backends, I only want to allow traffic from my web servers. That's, those are the only hosts that have any business talking to my backend. And security groups allow you to use this language almost verbatim to set up security in your application. So if we look at the security, we go to the security groups console, we look at the security group, I'll show you what these would actually look like in practice. So if I wanted to open up HTTP port 80 to the world for these web servers instance, I would put one rule here. I would say HTTP port 80, TCP traffic, I'm going to open this to zero slash zero. Now you notice I don't have any rules here about any other ports, any other protocols, that's intentional. If there isn't, if there isn't a security group rule for a certain kind of traffic, it gets rejected, which is what I want. Now let's look at the backend security group rule. You, you can have multiple rules, but, uh, but I have just one here. For the backend security group rule, you will see that um, this rule's a little bit more interesting. If you notice here, so in my imaginary example, it's port 2345 that the web servers reach into the backends. Um, that's what that means. So I've written this TCP rule that allows traffic on TCP traffic on port 2345, and you'll see that the source is not an IP address or IP address range or list of IP address ranges. It is another security group. Now think about that for a minute. That is so flexible, right? Because in a traditional world, if you, wanted one, if you wanted to permit traffic from one group of hosts to another, somebody be, need to be managing a list of IP addresses or IP address ranges, and they need to make sure it stayed current and it wasn't allowing things it should, and you'd have to kind of map that back. Here, it's totally clear what's going on. I'm referring to this other web server security group, allowing it in. And in fact, if I have this nice elastic application where I'm always adding new web servers and taking away web servers, that's fine. I don't need to think about its membership. The right things just happen here. So that's security group rule. That's security groups. A couple more words on security groups in VPC. I showed you ingress, inbound security group rules. Both security groups and network ACLs allow you to define both ingress rules, which are the most commonly used, and egress rules, outbound rules. Those are really useful if you need to get on top of um, you know, making sure that your instances are only initiating connections to, to other hosts. Um, as a best practice, you should do what I did with the, that backend security group, um, where I allowed in traffic by reference from other groups, right, you know, avoid trying to have to, you know, manage laundry lists of, uh, laundry lists of IP addresses. That's not cloudy, it's not easy, it's not fun. Um, here's another thing that I've observed with customers using ar architecting applications for security with security group rules. 
So as you learn about AWS, um, one very, very useful thing is you launch EC2 instances. You can launch them into an identity and access management, IAM, that's our identity and access management service, an IAM role. Now an IAM role, what that does, if you launch an EC2 instance with an IAM role, it gives you a way to declare certain specific permissions that your instance is authorized to do on your behalf. And this obviates the need for you to have to smear credentials across your EC2 instances, which is a security worst practice. So IAM roles, great, wonderful tool. You should absolutely be using it if you care about security. Now, I've noticed that many customers have a one-to-one -one relationship between IAM roles that they launch EC2 instances into and security groups. Now, if you think about that, that kind of makes sense. An IAM role is what this instance can do. A security group membership is who this instance can talk to, who can talk to it. And you can kind of see how there might be, conceptually, as you're architecting your application, a one-to-one -one relationship between what you can do and who you can talk to. So great, we have built this internet-connected VPC. Now, for many of you, many of you are done here. Many of you, you create this VPC, it's your network, it's just gonna work, it's in all the availability zones, um, you have connectivity to the internet, you're doing your security groups, right following the architecture of your application, and you have a great, secure, internet-connected network in the cloud, and you're done. But you can do more with VPC, and that's what the rest of this talk is going to be. Connectivity options beyond just uh, internet access. I'm gonna pick on three particular examples. If you recall, a couple minutes ago, I talked about Route, route tables and how you have this default route table for the VPC, but you can do routing on a subnet by subnet basis. I'm gonna go into some scenarios and examples of when you might want to do this. We're also gonna talk about VPC peering. VPC peering is, VPC peering is a tool that'll, that gives you private connectivity between multiple VPCs that you may have in the cloud. And we'll talk about why you might have multiple VPCs in the cloud. And finally, we're gonna talk about, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, Amazon Virtual Private Network, VPN, and Direct Connect. These are a pair of technologies that allow you to have a secure private connection between your VPC and your own data center, your own corporate network. First, let's talk about routing on a subnet by subnet basis and why you might do this. Now, if you look at our documentation on VPC, you will see, um, you'll see that there's, there's some talk about public subnets and private subnets, and what they mean by that um, when, when you see our documentation talk about public subnets, it's a subnet with a route to the internet. When you see it talk about private subnets, it's a subnet without a route to the internet. Um, I prefer to use the terms internet connected and internal because that's sort of more precise. Like your, your internet connected subnet is not public unless you open up all of the security group rules or something like that. Um, but so you're gonna hear me talk about internet connected subnets and non-internet connected subnets. Back to our example over here. You'll see that, uh, you, you'll recognize this, we've got our web servers, we got our backends, and remember we put them into different security groups and that's good security. But let's say you need to go a step further. Maybe you have compliance requirements that require you to demonstrate that there is really no way to reach, for, to reach those backend instances from the internet, that you actually have multiple ways of preventing access from the internet to the, to the backend servers. Or maybe you just like kind of a belt and suspenders approach. So absolutely put these in different security groups, get your rules right, but in addition to that, you could put these two different types of EC2 instances into different subnets. Okay, now if I have different subnets, what does that mean I can do? Well, for the web servers, the web servers, I do want them to be internet facing. So in my route table, I have a zero slash zero route to the internet gateway that is attached to my VPC. Great, but in my backends, maybe I don't. Maybe I have no route to the internet, and if I have no route to the internet, then I really know that you can't get to these backends. You can't get to these backends from the internet. Now. Of course, life sometimes is a little bit more complicated than that. I'm gonna redraw this picture with the internal and internet facing subnets uh, side by side. Um, you know, because over here, on the, uh, over here on the right hand side, I got an internet facing subnet. It's got a zero slash zero route to the internet gateway that's attached to my VPC. Over on the left, I don't have such a route. But maybe I do sometimes 
need my internal facing, my instances in the internal facing subnet, maybe sometimes I do need them to reach out to the internet. For example, maybe sometimes they want to reach out to a yum repo and update packages or something like that. Um, and, but I want them to do it behind a NAT, behind network address translation. I don't want to have to give each of them a public IP address and put them on the internet. So for this scenario, what you can do to solve this problem, to have an internal facing subnet with EC2 instances that don't have public IP addresses, that don't have a route to the internet, Instead of creating a 0 slash 0 route to the internet gateway, which is not what you want here, that's not what you intended, instead you launch a NAT, network address translation, EC2 instance, in your internet facing subnet and route all of your 0 slash 0 traffic to it. So that, that internet bound traffic goes to the NAT instance, gets NATed, gets sent out to the internet from there and, and, the, and the reverse as well. And uh, lest you think that, and, and you'll see this, you'll, you'll see that our uh, wizard for creating a VPC in our console even will create, stamp out this setup for you. Um, and lest you think that you have to go implementing that NAT instance logic yourself, you don't. Um, this is what you can search for. This is an Amazon machine image name. Uh, you can search for this. This Amazon, if you launch an EC2 instance with this Amazon machine image, it's already ready to do your NAT logic for you. Okay, so that's, that's routing on a subnet by subnet basis. Let's talk more about routes. And in fact, let's talk about when you might have multiple VPCs in the cloud and how you can get connectivity between them. So first, let's talk about use case here. Um, there's a couple reasons why you might run. Many customers just run one VPC in the cloud. It's their network, and it just works, and that's fine. Um, there are, there are some scenarios where you might wish to run multiple VPCs. Um, one, that, one that I see sometimes is uh, organizations have entirely different VPCs for uh, development, QA, production environments. So that's one case. Another case is one, uh, one that I have, one like the one I have on the board here. Like maybe you work for a very large organization where you want individual teams to own their own networks. You want to give individual teams each their own VPC so each of them can decide exactly how to best configure it to meet its needs. You don't want some central authority trying to, uh, trying to arbitrate the, VP the uh, VPC for everybody. So you give these teams their separate VPCs. But of course, you know, you're a large organization. You have some really nice common infrastructure for everybody to use, logging, authentication, monitoring, all this kind of stuff that all of these teams with their own individual VPCs need access to. Now, of course, one thing you could do is you could take your internal services, put them on the internet, have everybody reach them through the internet, and that would work. But of course, these are internal services. They don't really have much of a reason to live on the internet. And that is exactly the scenario that uh, VPC peering is designed to enable. VPC peering, what it does is, you know, given a pair of VPCs, and of course, you can peer multiple VPCs with each other, but we'll talk about a peering between two VPCs here. If I have my VPC over here, 170, our familiar 172.31 slash 16, and then some other VPC over here, 10.55 slash 16, um, what VPC peering allows us to do is allows us to have, it allows us to have, it allows us to have private connectivity between these two networks, it does not go out through the internet. It is private connectivity with an EC2 over private IP addresses between these two networks. Now, of course, you probably notice that these two address ranges, they don't overlap. That's no accident. You can't peer address ranges that overlap for the reasons that you think. And that's why, that is, that is one reason why it's important to think about the IP address ranges that you choose for your VPC. Okay, so let's just walk through the steps involved in establishing a peering, because a peering doesn't exist. Peerings are established via kind of a two-way handshake between both sides. Um, the peering doesn't exist until both sides have agreed to it, for, you know, for the reasons that you think. Um, and uh, another thing worth noting is that blue VPC, it could either be in my account or it could be in some other account, because we see many customers have, are running AWS in multiple accounts, sometimes for ease of financial accounting reasons. Um, so the first step, if I decide that I want to peer with this VPC because I want to use, maybe I want to consume some services that are in this VPC, the first thing I do is I initiate a peering request. Here's how that looks on our console. I say, okay, here's another VPC that I want to peer with. It is in, in my example, it was in my account, but it, like as you see here, you can choose a VPC in another account. 
but we don't have a peering yet. We don't have a peering yet because we don't have a peering until you have accepted the peering request. And that looks like this. You'll see this in your VPC peering console. You'll see that you have a, you have a peering request that is pending acceptance from me, and you will accept it, or you will reject it. You'll accept it, and once you accept it, now we have a peering. We have a peering, but nothing interesting happens in a VPC without a route, without something in our route table. Because right now my route table doesn't really say what to do with packets that are destined to 10.55 addresses. So here's what I do. We create routes, and I have to create a route from my end to your VPC, and you have to create a route from your end to my VPC. And here's how that looks like. It's this one. You'll see, you know, you, you should be getting familiar with this route table notation. Uh, 10.55 slash 16, so that means packets that are trying to get to your VPC. They go to the PCX, so the peering connection. There's a line below that. We're going to talk about that later. But what this means in English is that if I'm sending traffic to your VPC, don't send it out to the internet. Send it to the peering connection, and it will get right there. And I, in fact, use your private IP addresses to send traffic. So you've created kind of two VPCs that are an extension of one another's networks. But let's talk about existing networks that you have. Maybe you have, a, maybe you have an existing, uh, maybe you have an existing data center that you would like to connect to your VPC securely and privately. Maybe you have on-premises infrastructure. Um, AWS VPN and Direct Connect, these are the pair of technologies that you use to do this. And this is very useful for customers who are, who want to do either for a period of time or, you know, or forever want to do a hybrid deployment where some applications are running on premises and some applications running in the cloud, but they need to be able to talk to each other. If that sounds like your scenario, then these, the, these technologies are for you. I'm going to kind of scratch the surface here. We've got a great talk later this week um, doing a deep dive into Direct Connect and VPN. Um, so if you're interested in learning a lot more about it, I would, uh, I would definitely recommend that you check that out. So here's the setup for both VPN and Direct Connect. Over on the left, I have my data center um, or my on-premises network. Over on the right, I have my VPC. And the things you can use to connect them, uh, you've got VPN, you've got Direct Connect, and both of them accomplish the same thing, which is, a, which is to make these two networks an extension of each other, make these two networks able to talk to each other. All right, first let's talk about VPN. I'm going to give you kind of the vocabulary, what you need to know to get started um, making a, uh, creating a VPN. So the first thing you need in order to have a VPN, this is the name is Hardware VPN. You need, you need a device. We call it a customer gateway. You're the customer. This is your gateway. This is a device that you own, that you manage in your data center. This is, you know, this is a device that you own and manage um, that is capable of being your side of the IPsec tunnels that get created for a VPN connection. Now, um, if you have set up a VPN connection before, you probably already have this equipment. We have in our documentation a long list of devices that we have tested for VPN, in, in fact, including uh, instructions on, you know, vendor by vendor instructions for how to set these things up. We have instructions for a variety of vendors. So you got your device, that's one end of the VPN connection. Our end of the VPN connection, or your VPC's end of the, direct, uh, of, the, uh, of the VPN connection, is called a virtual private gateway. You'll see it referred to as VGW in the route tables. And when you set these things up, you follow the instruction to set up, what you get is you get a pair of IPsec tunnels. And you remember how I said, talking about the internet gateway, that it's not a single point of failure, it's, it's not a thing, it's like you know a highly scaled, available thing. Well, here you actually, these IPsec tunnels, they do end somewhere. We create two of them, and that's for high availability on our side. These two IPsec tunnels, they terminate in different availability zones on our end. And, you know, so we're taking advantage of our own high availability, availability zone story to be able to give you these two redundant uh, connections that you can fail over between. So we strongly recommend that you go ahead and configure uh, both of them. Now, of course, nothing exciting happens in a VPC without a route. And that's what we do. Your route table, 
for your VPC, we'll have a, you'll add a route to it that says traffic that's trying to go to my data center gets sent to the virtual gateway. Same concept as before. And like you can see, what's going on here, it is, it's, it's very visible. Um, you can see that uh, over here I have this route. Um, I have this list of routes and I can see where the traffic is going and what's supposed to happen to it. Can you have a, connect, can you have a route to both, one route to the VGW and one route to your internet gateway? You absolutely can and that's a common scenario. Um, if you want your VPC to be both connected to the internet and connected to your on-premises network, that's fine. Just create route rules for each of those, one to an internet gateway and one to a virtual private gateway. So that's kind of the lingo of VPN. That's, these are the sort of the things that you need to know to get started. Let's talk about when you might use that and when you might use Direct Connect, which is our other technology for creating a secure private connection between your on-premises network and ours. So both of these do the same thing, a secure connection between your data center and, uh, and your VPC. Uh, VPN, you know, as you saw, it's a pair of encrypted IPsec tunnels that go over the internet. Um, so that means, it, you know, it's secure, but it goes over the internet, which means you're limited by whatever data transfer rates that you can get over the internet. You're also paying internet data, data transfer rates here. Direct Connect is really for customers who, are, who anticipate transferring a lot more data between your on-premises network and your VPC. Um, it, it, direct Connect is what it sounds like. It is a direct connection, a dedicated line between your equipment and ours and one of many co-location centers all around the world. And if you have a direct connect, you'll be paying a, we offer port speeds of one gigabit per second, 10 gigabit per second. Um, and you can go sub one gig with the help of our partners. And it gives you a lower per gig, it gives you a lower per gig uh, data transfer rate than VPN. So really your choice between VPN and direct connect should be driven a lot by how much data you anticipate flowing between them. Like I said, a great deep dive into these concepts uh, later this week. For highest availability, you can use both and use BGP for failover between the two of them. All right, so enough about connectivity. Let's talk about what's actually going on within your VPC. And I'm gonna bring up one example of something that just gets so much easier in a VPC than it is in a traditional networking environment. So those of you from a traditional networking world know that you need to think about DNS, you know, resolution of DNS names into IP addresses. And, you know, if you want to have any sort of control over it, you're probably talking about running name servers. You have to be pretty conversant in these concepts, keeping them available, because DNS is really, really important. What VPC allows you to do is it gets you out of all of that. You don't have to do that, but at the same time, it gives you excellent control over how DNS works in your VPC without actually having to run the DNS yourself. So here's what I mean by that. If I look at my VPC, I'll see over in the right-hand corner, I'll see that there are two DNS settings on it. DNS resolution, DNS host names. I've said yes to both. You probably will, too. Um, DNS resolution is answering the question, do you, want, do you want us to do DNS for you? Most of you choose yes, although if you don't want that, if you really do want to run your own name servers, you can in AWS. You would say no here and then set up your own name servers and run your own DNS. If you say yes here, you don't have to do anything and DNS just works, which is great. The other option here, uh, which I recommend choosing, there's really no reason not to, um, is when you launch EC2 instances in your VPC and you have this setting on, you get two DNS names for the price of zero for your EC2 instance. All right, one of them over here, this one over here, it says IP-172-31-something. Um, it looks like it has the private IP address of my EC2 instance embedded in it, and it does. Um, what this DNS name does, if I try to resolve it, uh, if I try to resolve it inside my VPC, it gives me that private IP address like you might expect. Outside my VPC, this DNS name has no meaning. If I try to resolve it, I get no answer. In DNS speak, that's an NX domain. So outside the VPC doesn't mean anything. Inside the VPC means my IP address, my private IP address. But this is the more interesting of the two DNS names. Um, if you look at this one, I have this EC2 instance that has a public IP address. Um, 52, it, it looks like it has the public IP address embedded in it, and it does. And here's what's neat about this, this DNS name that, that we automatically assigned your instance, is that it works correctly from everywhere. So if I try to resolve, so this is a Windows machine, it's out on the internet. If I try to resolve this DNS name from somewhere outside my VPC, 
you'll see that I get what you expect, the public IP address of this EC2 instance. And that's, you know, if you're outside my VPC, that is absolutely the correct way to get to this instance is through its public IP address. So that's the right answer. But if I go inside my VPC, if I go inside my VPC and resolve this same name, you'll see that what I get here, that's not the public IP address, that's the private IP address of the instance. And that's the correct answer. The correct way to send traffic within your VPC so that it gets routed with that local route, so that, it, so that your security groups, which you've architected correctly and in a cloudy way, so the security groups, so they work the way you want, you want to be sending traffic to this instance by its private IP address. And this DNS, this DNS, this DNS host name that we gave you, it resolves to the right thing from everywhere, which is really, really handy. But there's more with DNS, and this is super handy. Amazon Route 53 is the AWS DNS service, and you can do all the DNS things with Route 53. Um, you, can, you, know, you can register domain names, you can create DNS zones out on the internet. It's got a fantastic availability story. There's a great deep dive into Route 53 later this week. But one thing Route 53 lets you do with your VPC is you can create something called a private hosted zone. In English, a private hosted zone is your own world of DNS inside your VPC, which means you get to control how DNS works without running DNS in your VPC. Let me show you an example of what you can do with Route 53 private hosted zones. So here I'm gonna go to the Route 53 console. And you'll see here I have created a private hosted zone on demohostedzone.org. I don't own that domain. I don't think anybody does. You could go out and buy it. I don't own that domain, but I get to make the rules out, out of, I get to make the rules over exactly how this resolves in my VPC. So you'll see over here, I created a private hosted zone. And over here, I've associated it with my VPC. And you can associate it with multiple VPCs in any of the regions. And what that means is I've basically taken over demohostedzone.org in my VPCs. So if I go over here, I'll just for, for the sake of demonstration here, I'll create, a, I'll create an A record. That means it resolves to an IPv4 address. For example, .demohostedzone.org. I say that that should resolve to 172.31.0.99. Now that's an address in my VPC. It doesn't even have to be. It can be anything. You make the rules here. So now if I go to my EC2 instance and I try to resolve example hosted, demohostedzone.org, you'll see that I get the answer I said I should. This is so easy. I had to do almost nothing to make that happen. I don't even need to be a DNS expert in order to make that happen. So that's just one example of the kinds of things, kinds of services that you usually need to provide in a network that are made just so easy and flexible and visible by VPC. Oh, but there's so much more. There's so much more you can do with a VPC, and we have just scratched the surface. And I hope this kind of, I hope this kind of gives you things you can sort of look into to do more with your network. Um, just to give you kind of a, 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 just, the, just the smallest glimpse of uh, what else you can do in your VPC. This year, we uh, launched a new feature for VPC called uh, VPC Flow Logs. Now, this gives you an unprecedented level of visibility into exactly what is going on exact with your network traffic to and from all of your EC2 instances. What it is, is if you turn on flow logs, you can opt into a full metadata dump of all of the packets that are going to your EC to and from your EC2 instances. And not only the ones that actually succeeded in going to and from your VPC instances, but the ones that your security groups are rejecting. So if you really want to understand what kind of traffic you're getting and not getting, you can turn on flow logs. Um, now, you could do this in a traditional networking environment. You could do something like run TCP, dump on your hosts, and create some sort of infrastructure to collect them. But here, it's easy. You turn this on, and you go to CloudWatch Logs, which is our AWS logging service, to pick them up. And then you can analyze them. You can use them for troubleshooting. You can use them for kind of security types of analysis. So interesting what you get um, when you start analyzing your application up close like this. Another thing that we released this year is uh, Amazon VPC endpoints for S3. And what this is, you remember how you know, some of you are going to be creating subnets in your VPC, or maybe even entire VPCs that don't have a route to an internet gateway, don't have connectivity to the internet. But yet, Amazon Simple Storage Service, this is where you're putting your data. This is an important part of your application. And you want a secure way to get between your VPC and your S3 that doesn't involve the internet. 
Well, that is what S3 endpoints does. You can almost think of this as a wormhole from your VPC to S3. And it gives you great control over the data that's a part of your application. You can control policy at the VPC endpoint part of the connection, meaning I can say exactly what this VPC is and is not allowed to do in S3 and at which S3 buckets and objects. And I can also specify policy over here at my S3 bucket. I can say that this bucket is accessible only from this VPC endpoint, which means only from this VPC. So I have control two ways over how the data that is part of my application is secured. So this was a very popular feature that we, uh, that we launched this year. Classic link. This is another, so those of you who have been around a long time, you'll know that when we first launched EC2 in, e -E in 2006, um, there wasn't a VPC. Your EC2 instances, they would launch into a flat network, you know, a flat AWS network. We'd give you the IP addresses, we'd tell you it's connected to the internet, give you a public IP address. You didn't get a lot of the controls that we've just spent the last hour talking about. And many customers, who, and, and we have many customers who are running mission critical, highly successful applications on EC2 Classic. It's a great product. Um, those customers are looking at VPC and saying they want to take advantage of many of these options, many of these security options, network management options. And what Classic Link is, it gives you private connectivity between those EC2 Classic instances in the flat network and the instances in your VPC, which is a great path, it's a great on-ramp for migrating an application to VPC without taking downtime. There are two great talks about migrating from EC2 Classic to VPC uh, this week, both by customers, one by Twilio, one by Pinterest, uh, talking about how they, are, how they are making that move from Classic to VPC. So if that's the situation that you're facing, that's, those, these are definitely talks that you will want to uh, check out. There is so much more. There is so much more. You're not even close to done with VPC, although you do now understand what you need in order to have a network for your EC2 instances that just works. There's a whole bunch of talks later this week, deep dives into various aspects of VPC and surrounding services like, uh, like, like Route 53, like classic to VPC migration. And all of this allows you to manage your network like a boss, whether or not you're a networking expert. Make it easy, make it flexible, make it visible what's going on. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, please remember to uh, fill out your evaluations. Thank you.